Um, you know, when I listen to your music now, and it's, it's been really driven home for me on Wildflower, the new album, that I think that, that you are a distinctly Australian sounding project. And I think that the music that I hear, it has a sort of wide open sky to it. It's a very flowery kind of thing to say, you know, like it was a very wide open sounding record. But I do hear it driving down the coast in Australia, which, let's be honest, is blessed. I mean, is that a fair observation? Do you think that even though you record in different places and everything else, that ultimately what you make, that emotion, that feeling you're looking for, the heart and avalanches really is is in Australia? I think in the, I, what you're saying about the wide open spaces, I'd, I'd agree with that. Yeah. And especially because this record is, is feels like a bit of a road trip. And the big, wide, expansive country like Australia kind mm. of sums that up. Yeah, and we spent a lot of our teenage years, you know, just driving around in, in cars in the country and, in suburbia, listening to music, and that's what you do, and that was kind of in our heads making this record as well. You know, it's like for us, this record was almost like that, supposed to capture that feeling of you know, you're growing up, you jump in the car, you hit the road with a six pack, and you head out to the bush somewhere. And the driver doesn't drink it, that's bad. I'm looking at the people on this on this album now, and I want to start with Camp Low because that's one of my favorite rap duos ever. So the idea of working with them, let's just go through that and how that happened. Their record was a record that we just used to play endlessly on tour, like all the time. Yeah, and it and we we dropped sections of their first record as part of our live shows in between songs. I mean, it was it was almost our standby record. So you know how a record just becomes part of your life. So. We just reached out and um, we just couldn't believe uh, what we heard back. Like that was just done remotely, that collaboration. Mm. Yeah, yeah. One of my favourite songs on the album, without a doubt, is Colours, you know, featuring Jonathan Donahue from Mercury Rev. Just an amazing vocal performance from him that w- weaves itself perfectly into this groove. Just tell us a little story about the making of that and, and like give us some idea about how that song came to exist. I think Tony came up with that sample initially and we had it kicking around for a while. And it was actually like... Uh, I think we were listening to Donuts a lot around that time and we were kind of like, yeah, we would, something hypnotic like that would be really cool. So we worked on it for about two days with Robbie's mum. Oh, that's right. She, <laughs> so she was sitting there just listening to it over and over and over again and we're going, are you getting sick of it? She's like, no, I like it. I think it's nice. <laughs> <laughs> What's she doing? Is she just literally was like hanging out so in the she background? She's just in the lounge room hanging out. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> Yeah, so she was very involved in that one. Um, And working with Jonathan Donahue, one of the great vocalists of one of the great bands of the last of two decades, I think. You know, was that a no-brainer for you guys? I mean, was he always on the wish list? Uh, Yeah, Yeah. I mean, you know, that that first Mercury record was something that really inspired us. It was so raw and crazy. So crazy. And so alive, you know. And uh, he has actually been so unbelievable like he has literally kind of saved our ass a number of times you know in terms of like musical input but also kindness and love and advice and he's someone who he he just really i don't know he's like a big brother yeah guiding us through the process and um you know none of the songs were easy to finish with the vocalists it was like it was always back and forward back and forward because we didn't want the vocals to just seem you know tacked on guesty yeah yeah you know it really needed to feel like part of the music otherwise we, we didn't really want to do it i'm actually quite stunned that you know the majority of them were kind of done in a modern way done remotely and sent to you because it sounds so the collaborations sound really glued together well 75,000 emails later you kind of <laughs> you kind of get there <laughs> what was the hardest one to finish what was the one that we were most proud of that when you, you know that was the hardest to wrangle what was the wildest toss on the record Ah, uh, gee, was Frankie? Yeah, Frankie was a difficult record to mix, actually. Um, you know, because that, yeah, that got mixed for about two and a half years. <laughs> <laughs> okay, how many reference mixes were done? What number did it get up to? That was, oh, don't, oh, ask, Robbie, don't ask, man. Like, oh, it's kind of embarrassing. Thousand? It'd be over a hundred. The way that you guys, uh, you know, you sequence the record is such an important part of an Avalanche's album experience. Um, how long does it take to wrangle that once you know you've got the music in place? I mean, I can imagine that this is probably one of the most creative but also most painstaking parts of the process. Yeah. yeah. That, actually, that's kind of what took so long, really. It's yeah. like because there was so much music hanging around and that, like there's some that beautiful that tracks. Some of my favorite tracks didn't make it. You know, we had to learn to let go of some bits of music that we really love because they didn't contribute to the overall feeling of the record. So it was just about trying to start the record off in the right way. And once we sort of had that feeling right, we just built upon it really and, and selected tracks that we'd made that fitted. And um, it's kind of like making a mixtape. 
You know, it was it took a long time. time. Yeah, yeah, a long, long time. Is there a modern interpretation of avalanches now? And by modern, I mean somebody who's willing to be a little bit more. You said let go, but also let go of the way that the music is presented. You know how it, you know there's ways to do it like you do it in a painstaking and detailed and beautiful way, and then there's ways that other people do it, which is they just sneak attack with with tracks to get, keep things moving. You know, would you do that with these, some of these other songs that didn't make it into a long form sequence? Could you see yourself putting them out as individual pieces of music or, or, or release in a different way? Or do you think it'll always be this kind of long form mixtape type approach? I think we're, we're specifically with these pieces of music, we, we definitely want to get them out quite soon because they feel like they're part of this project. Yeah. And so I um, really just need to move on. <laughs> so you can see a time when, when, when they'll be released in their own right. Definitely, definitely. I, I, we've already had discussions about hopefully, with, you know, within the first year or so of this record being out, we want to package up everything else and put that out too because it's, it's, from, it's from the same time period and then, yeah. and then the slate will be sort of clean to make new music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's talk about one of the most uh, amazing things on, I've seen on, I was going to say on paper, do there's anyone looking at anything on paper these days? On screen now uh, in a very long time. It's not often you get to see Biz Marquis and Jean-Michel Bernard uh, on the same song. Now, this uh, song called Noisy Eater, which you said before, kind of sort of came out of an older project. Um, when I hear this, it makes me feel great, great joyful emotions hearing Biz Marquis talking about Eat. the way he eats food. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> man. I mean, that's like, I don't know. Yeah, the song makes me happy too, you know. And, and, and uh, yeah, to have Jean-Michel on there, like we feel like he brought this kind of, Tripped out, you know, Sergeant Pepper's orchestration to that yeah. to that song, and he's amazing. He just sends something that he'd do in a day, and it was like, holy crap, this would take two years to do. That <laughs> was always perfect, and we didn't yeah. have to do anything to it. Let's talk about the song Step Kids, okay, with Jennifer Rima and uh, and obviously with uh, Warren Ellis, who's you know one of Australia's greatest gifts to look to the world, you know, from the from the Dirty Three, and of course, No Cave. Um, let's talk about that, that, that record and uh, you know what you were trying to achieve with that and the idea of putting Warren on this and because again it's just one of those great collabs on the, on the album yeah it's, quite, it's probably my favourite song so it's a little bit of like the odd one out like it's like a bit of a country tune or something yeah. on the album but it, it's raw and it's kind of a bit the vocals are very lopsided. rough but it's but it's an amazing vocal yeah I mean that was like one of those moments where you just kind of pinch yourself and when you hear Jennifer's lyrics and how perfectly she summed up the feeling of what the album was about, you know, like I couldn't, I couldn't have wished for that to turn out any different. What did Fa Father John Misty do on the record to finish the album on Saturday Night Inside Out? I know you got DC Berman on the song. What, what did Father John Misty contribute to it? Father John Misty is doing a lot of layered, beautiful Beach Boys as harmonies, Just harmonies in the background that are kind of floating up and down through the track. Yeah, I mean, it's you know, it's an amazing texture to it. When you're working with an artist like that, who's one of the great lyricists of our of our time right now, and you and you don't rely on him in that way, is that that's an exercise in restraint. Yeah, well, that was his choice, actually. <laughs> I mean, so we didn't have a choice. <laughs> so his his vibe was like, I want to be textural on this. Yeah, yeah must yeah. must have been what he was feeling <laughs> at the time. So we got no other lyrics, but ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> but still, it's better than most lyrics that are out there right now. Um, okay, so true. There's, I mean, there's other people who are on the record which need their, their time, um, you know, and I want to talk about Tori Imoa, uh, who, again, is somebody we're a big fan of. Again, another great song on this album called If I Was a Folk Star. Um, it's, it's, it's song number six in the track listing. So um, give us your in interpretation of how that came to be because, again, that's another one. That's sort of where the record starts to actually pick up a little bit of pace and starts to sort of change its direction a little bit. Yeah, yeah, definitely at that point. I think he was he was recently married and, and he wrote that those lyrics about doing LSD with his wife on the beach. That's it was what something happened. like that, yeah. Yeah, and um, because, you know, that was kind of right near the end of the, of the process and the record and, and this kind of road trip feeling was already taking shape. So it just fitted in perfectly. That, that piece of music is actually really old. We'd had that hanging around for years. Mm. Um, we loved it, but we could just sort of, we never knew what to do with it. And we sent it to Chaz and... Um, that vote was just yeah, perfect. Yeah. yeah. What came back it was amazing, yeah. Not to distract from Wildflower because there's other people I want to talk about real quick, you know, that are on the record. But I mean, do some of these songs have other collaborators that we don't yet know about? I mean, are there more sort of artists that you collaborated with that didn't make it into this body of work? Yeah, there are. Yeah, there's uh, oh, August Arnell. We did some stuff with that was absolutely fantastic. You know, from uh, Kid Creole and the Coconuts, he was absolutely brilliant. Uh, we did some stuff. Luke? Luke Steele? Yeah, the Luke Steele song almost made it. Actually, that was brilliant. Uh, 
Jen Zleckman, who did the tune with. Yeah. Oh, Conan Moccasin as well. That was that was really beautiful. Anybody that you really wanted on the record that didn't get a chance to make it on for just for scheduling reasons, one reason or another, that was just like that was a real sort of kicker. Because I mean, everyone else is so phenomenal. But was there one that got away? I think the song we did with Luke is really cool, and it just it we just couldn't find a way to finish it in time. Mm. When did you know the album was? finished you there must have been a, a watershed moment for you guys when you looked at each other and you felt like okay that's the sort of the last note like it's done and how did you feel <laughs> it was the night before mastering yeah because <laughs> Bobby had to fly out to master and it was his flight left at I think 7 30 in the morning so we were in the studio till 6 30 that morning till he literally was like I've got to go man I've got to hop on the planes <laughs> and we were like we think it sounds good okay I'm gonna miss the flight yeah Oh, that's the best ending of a record ever. <laughs> we spent 16 years to look at each other and went, f*** it. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And that, that yeah, it was kind of like... No, we were too tired to be happy. We were just like, oh, f*** <laughs> yeah, good luck. Uh. Well, it's about to change. You know, it's about to get very real because <laughs> you got Primavera, obviously. How are you feeling about performing live taking into account what we talked about before and leaving behind Avalanches, you know, 1.0 and getting to this new Avalanches, you know, with, you know, the, the combination of DJing, the combination of having a band, uh, probably unlike last time you're rehearsing, I'd imagine this time. We are a little bit, actually. <laughs> meant, to be, meant to be rehearsing. Look, simple question. Do you feel ready? Yeah. Yeah, completely. Yeah. Because um, it's, it's, I mean, we've had so many offers to do shows, you know, in, the, in this long period, but without new music to play, it just, wouldn't be special you know so having new tunes to play is like that's that's a really special thing you know yes. it's really exciting are we re-engaged now i mean it, is this the start of more music to come of do you feel like y you want to carry this on now it's a it's a good question i i mean we'll always be making music i mean it's what we've done since we were kids you know i i personally have got that little spark of excitement building to be able to sample again and be able to make new tracks because, you know, like I said, fin finishing the record for the last year or so, we weren't actually making new stuff. We were just putting everything together. Stuff together, yeah. Yeah, so we kind of, like, got that little spark of a flame starting to ignite. We really do believe we could be deluding ourselves that in three years we'll have another one. <laughs>